This is the Powerlifting America podcast, and today we've got a quick check-in with Gavin Aiden just two weeks out from Sheffield. We discuss his prep and goals for Sheffield, his gritty performance at IPF Worlds in 2022, and a bunch of stuff about his mental approach to the game and life. This man is wise beyond his years, but before I bring him in, make sure you don't miss Sheffield. Tickets are still available. Click the link in the description below for more information. Thank you to SBD and Aleko for their continued partnership with Powerlifting America. If you're looking to compete in drug-tested powerlifting, whether you're just starting out or want to compete with the best in the world, make sure you go to powerlifting-america.com, become a member, check out our event page for all of our upcoming events and our store page for PA merch. Follow us on Instagram at powerlifting underscore America. And with that, let's get to this quick check-in with Gavin Aiden. All right. What's up, Gavin Aiden, 93 junior world champion. Welcome to the Powerlifting America podcast. How are you doing? Paul, How's prep going? I am doing phenomenal. Thank you so much. I just want to thank you for having me on. I think this is an awesome opportunity. I love doing stuff like this. And I'm really, really impressed with the direction that Powerlifting America has been going in. And it's because of stuff like this and because of people like you. So thank you so much um, for giving us the opportunity to do this. But anyway, yeah, prep is doing uh, prep is going really well, man. I'm actually very, very excited. I think we're uh, what, like 13 days out maybe or yeah. 12 days out, something like, like that. Two weeks to the day, basically. Yeah, very exciting stuff. So March 25th, um, we're basically exactly two weeks to the day that, you know, Saturday from today, um, you'll be competing at the biggest meet in history. And so how excited are you for this meet? I mean, how does this feel different in comparison to like, you've, you're, you're a junior world champion, you've competed at world open worlds before. Um, so it's not like it's going to be too big of a stage, but how does this one just feel different? You know, to be honest with you, um, it, it kind of doesn't, it, the way that I approach every meet is exactly how I would approach a training session. Um, nothing really changes. And in this sport, we have the luxury of exactly, literally exactly how we train is exactly how we play. Um, mm -hmm. There is nothing that changes with the exception of the environment, which will always change, you know? Um, and so for me, man, my approach is pretty much the same. My mindset doesn't really change. Um, and I'm going into this meet as if it, again, it's just another training session. Uh, of course, I recognize that if this is going to be absolutely insane, I mean, mm -hmm. it's setting a precedent unlike any other, and I'm super excited about that and about the opportunity there is as an athlete, but also as obviously a partner of SBD um, and a member of powerlifting, you know, mm -hmm. um, I think it's amazing what it's going to do for the sport. But outside of that, as an athlete, I approach this no different than I would a training session. Yeah. Did it feel, was it special to be invited? Um, you know, getting that invite, I know we were all kind of like waiting for those final few invites to drop. And, um, it was really cool to see, you know, it, the final invites going to a couple of Americans, you know, you, Michael Davis, Jonathan Keiko. Um, so was it special when you got the invite? It was man. I mean, it was uh bittersweet, of course, you know, in my mind, I, I have a very I'm my own worst critic and uh, mm -hmm. I, I have a tough time celebrating my wins and I have the easiest time in the world harping on my losses, you know? And so for me, I kind of went into it way before I ever got the call. I was thinking, you know, if I got the wild card, would I accept it? And not so much as a matter of like, oh, is this even worth, you know, meat worth doing? It wasn't yeah. like that. It was, I didn't earn it. You know, I didn't really actually earn my spot. SBD was very clear and explicit about how you earn your spot. You hit the uh, the adequate score by, and become a world champion. You mm -hmm. do that and you can go. And I failed to do that. So, you know, um, I had felt in my heart that I was like, you know what? I don't know if I truly deserve to be on that stage. Um, and when I I did have a call with, with Pete about a month or two uh, prior to actually receiving the official invite, mm -hmm. and he asked, he was like, look, man, you know, it's, nothing's official, um, but we are considering you for a wild card spot. If we did invite you, would you accept it? And immediately my gut said, yes, absolutely do it. Take it 100%. Not only is this a phenomenal opportunity, but um, this is a chance for me to, I don't want to say like a redemption meet, but this is a chance to evolve, you know, mm -hmm. and what better way to do it than to do it at the first Sheffield event ever, you know? Um, yeah. And again, dude, my approach to this meet, dude, I don't even care about the outcome. I don't care about winning. This is, I mean, well, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but the Sheffield <laughs> yes. has become a national championship for us 93s, you know? So, yeah. so, and obviously I want to go back to worlds and win an open world title and stuff, but I don't even care about anything anymore. You know, I genuinely just want to feel the weight and lift it. Um, and push my body as far as I can go. I want to feel all the pain. So um, with that in mind, I was honored. I was grateful. I was not surprised. Um, I know some people 
kind of take offense to that, but I mean it in the most respectful way possible. I'm not surprised when I uh, receive opportunities like this because that's what I do. Like this is, I was born for this. Um, I believe we were all born for this, but I know the greatness I'm capable of. And so why should I be surprised when great opportunities come my way? This is what I've built. This is the whole point, you know? So Um, so I was honored, grateful, not surprised. And at one point I was considering, I was like, you know, I don't know, should I accept it? Should I not? Um, but when I did get that call a couple months prior, I, I, my gut kind of answered for me. So I love that. I mean, that's such a, you have such a different perspective than almost any of the other powerlifters and, and you have a different perspective than a lot of athletes. Um, you have a Supreme belief in yourself that really comes across. And, um, I love that you even thought about it for a second. And the only reason why you weren't going to why you considered not doing it was just simply with that fact of like, you didn't feel like you earned it, you know? And that was really the only barrier. That was the only obstacle to you saying yes, was just this feeling of holding yourself to a higher standard than anyone else can hold you to. So even though you're getting this invite in the back of your head, you're still thinking, you know, I didn't earn this, but I'm, I'm going to take advantage of the opportunity. So um, that's such a great perspective and so different. And already we're like two minutes in, you've already dropped like a bunch of gems. <laughs> uh, so this is going to be a good one. I can feel it. Um, so with, with Sheffield, I mean, specifically, what kind of goal do you have? Do you have a specific goal? You've talked about 900 kilos at 93 kilos body weight. Um, it, or is there a certain number or are you just kind of, kind of see what the day holds and just leave every single, you know, drop out there on the, on the platform? Yeah, I think, I think it might be the latter. Uh, obviously mm-hmm. as an athlete, I have goals, um, and, you know, my tendency is to kind of overreach in my head as to what's possible. Mm -hmm. Um, It's funny, like, yes, I have specific number goals, absolutely. And I have a total number goal as well, but I'm very detached from it. Like, I don't really care if I get it or not. What I care more about is in the, like, actually in the present moment, how far can I push myself? Mm -hmm. So when it's third attempt squat, what number are you calling? right? What number are you putting in? And in that present moment, it's not so much of like, well, this is the game plan. Well, we want to win. Well, it's genuinely, what is my body? What can I push myself to do? How can I go beyond and prove to myself that I'm worth being on this planet? You know, and that, that's the feeling that I have. Um, So I'm very detached from outcomes, from numbers, from money, from all that stuff. Naturally, of course, um, all my goals are so high that if I hit them or exceed them, not only will, you know, world records be broken, but people will lose against me, you know? And so obviously that kind of follows suit, you know, Um, or even if you don't hit your, your goal number, because they're so high, you might still also win. Um, so that's something to think about as well, because I know you've talked about this 900 kilo and you've said that's sort of like the basement that people should be looking at. And 900 is a big deal for 93s. I mean, that's something that's never been done. It's well above the world record. Um, it's something that, you know, the qualifying total for the 105s was like 901, you know? Yeah. So for to have 93s and possibly a trio of, of them doing that, um, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be a crazy day. But so when you talk about, you know, you're, you're not really looking at like, what's the right number to call, like from like a game day coaching perspective, like, you know, you and I both have sat down and had dinner with Matt Gary before and um, talking about like, what's the right call to win the competition. But you are, I mean, you, you've already hinted at it, which I think is a sign of growth of where you said that you have a tendency to kind of overreach on your third attempts and to think that more is there than what is really there. And so do you have a game day coach that's going to be with you at Sheffield? That's going to try to, you know, your goal is to do as much as you can, but without going over, right? Like you still want to make nine attempts. Is that right? And uh, is that, is that the, is that what you're telling your game day coach? Yeah. So the way I like to describe it is as you become a more advanced lifter, um, and especially if you are in a competitive class and you don't have the luxury of just showing up, um, you have to be an executionist, like that becomes your job as an athlete. It's no longer anything other than just execution. More importantly, uh, the best way to describe it is it's a lot like ax throwing or archery or darts where, yeah, you can hit the black, sure, but you need to hit the bullseye. We really do. Mm -hmm. And you need to aim for the bullseye. And although it can be a little nerve wracking, sometimes it can be a little risky, it, you really, you just have to hit the bullseye, especially at this level, especially if you don't have the luxury of not being able to just show up. Right. And so for me, um, 
that's that fine line that we flirt with. It's kind of like skating on thin ice, you know, yeah. we want to make it across, but we have no choice. We have to do it. You know, there's, I mean, otherwise what's the point in showing up, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, so I do have a game day coach um, is actually my old uh, powerlifting coach, Alex Uslar. Okay. Um, yeah. So my current coach is John song. Very, very happy uh, with all the work we've been able to do. He's a freaking magician, man. Um, yeah. Honestly, and sure. so, so we, we have an awesome kind of connection too. But Alex and I also have phenomenal chemistry. And of course, he built me up um, from when I was like almost barely like a beginner power lifter all the way through till my junior world championship and, and even coached me going into open world in South Africa. So um, yeah. him and I have a great chemistry. He's a great guy, um, very smart. And uh, and I, his energy is what I want in a handler going into meets like this. Um He's a, he's a hype man, dude. He's a, he's a hype man. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not expecting him to know the game day strategy. I'm not expecting him to know where to chip and, you know, all that stuff. I'm sure mm -hmm. he knows how to do that, but that's not my, my goal. I'm really not worried about anybody else except for, you know, myself. And so I just know that if I show up and I do what I'm capable of, then I, I really won't have to worry. But you do want to make nine, nine attempts, right? I mean, like you don't want to miss, you don't want to push it to that edge of that envelope and fall off. You want to stop right on that edge of like, that was the most I was capable of that day. And I left it all out there. And I, and I grinded through that final third squad and third bench and third deadlift, but I got, I got the white lights. Yeah. Well, you know, this is the biggest meet ever in powerlifting. Yeah. I am not showing up to pull punches. So I have every intention of pushing my body to every limit that I have. I mean, I don't care if the muscle rips off the bone. So, you know, for me, <laughs> I, I know. mean, maybe some people think it's stupid. Some people, they can, they can think what they'd like. Um, but I want to be the greatest. I want to be the best that requires risks. And, uh, and obviously they're calculated risks. You know, I'm not going to load something that I don't think is, you know, humanly possible for me at this time. Um, yeah. but at the same token, I'm not going to give myself something that I know I could take and crush and go nine for nine, have a nice meet and call it a day. And, and even, even if I would be more, this is just kind of how my mind works. I would be, I was way, way more satisfied and proud of my performance at 2021 raw Nats when I pushed Keiko to his limit and I lost by a pound mm -hmm. by far compared to how I felt after junior worlds. I had won a junior world championship. Mm -hmm. If you had taken that total and put it up in the open world championship that year, I would have placed third, um, almost broke world records, almost brought like, and had I known those records in advance, I could have gone for them on my third pull. So you chipped them. Yeah. Yeah. And yet, and yet for me, I set junior world records at that meet for the bench. And yet for me, that meet was such an underperformance in my opinion, mm -hmm. despite winning the goal, despite traveling during COVID and also there's all the stuff that goes into that. Um, and the, the real reason why is because I knew that at raw Nats, I had pushed myself to my, I genuinely did not care about the scoreboard. I didn't care about my competition. I didn't care about anything. It was just go on the platform and do your best period mm -hmm. um, and give everything you have. And I know that if I do that, I will end up at the top. Um, and that's what I did at raw Nats. And I think the only lift that I regret not going up more on was the squat because I knew I had more in the tank. Um, and so long story short point that I'm okay. trying to get at here is I'm not showing up at Sheffield to pull punches. I'm not showing up at Sheffield to play it safe. That is not what this meet is about. Um, as far as I'm concerned, you only mm -hmm. win anything if you break world records and world records are important for a reason. They're, they're almost impossible to set. That's why they're a world record. Right. And so yeah. you can't, you can't do that by playing scared. You can't do that by playing safe and keeping, you know, keeping all your chips to yourself, so to speak, you know, you kind of yeah. have to put them, push them to the center of the table. That's why we love you, man. I mean, that's why you're such an inspiration for everyone. Um, I could see why SBD would invite you because you're coming in there as just like this terror that's just going to throw around the weight and you're not going to be like, it's like playing poker against someone that like isn't a very experienced poker player that knows all these little aspects of it, but just comes in and plays really when they have strong hands, they're not afraid to just go all in and they just disrupt the whole table, you know? Um, and so I think that's a really cool, you're, you're like kind of a wild card. I mean, literally a wild card. Uh, pick for Sheffield but I mean I think I think you're kind of going to be one of these guys that no one really knows exactly what you're going to do and that's what makes it fun and more unpredictable and more entertaining and I mean we we know what you're going to do which is we know you're going to leave it all out there we just don't know where that limit is you know so it's like we kind of know what we're getting with Gavin Aiden he's gonna you know go out on his shield for sure um, but we we're not exactly sure where your numbers are and where your strength is right now um, yeah. so that's what he's going to keep it exciting um, so I wanted to ask you you mentioned something about, I think this was in the SBD video. You said like you get nine attempts at one attempt at creating a legacy. 
Um, and is that what Sheffield means to you? Or is that basically how you approach everything you do in life? Not just, not just powerlifting meets. So it was a, it was a pseudo philosophy that I created for myself going into this meet. It took, Mm -hmm. I had to take some L's, you know, I mean, I feel like I've failed a lot and I continue to fail and fail and fail. And, and so, um, for me, it's, uh, I kind of had to detach after South Africa worlds. I had given, I genuinely, and I'm not afraid to say it. I really gave South Africa worlds, everything that I had, everything from the prep wise I put, dude, I invested as much money as I could that I have from my business into my prep, into PT, into the, like everything, dude, I covered every freaking thing. And to still not only uh, not win, but take fourth to me, that was, that was extraordinarily defeating. Um, And I had to really take a step back and again, number one, remind myself champions take full responsibility for the outcome, no matter what the outcome is. So it has to be me. There has to be something with me. And then when you really take a step back, you start to realize that the body tends to follow the mind, right? Even the subconscious behaviors and attitudes you have, it's because they're habits that you've developed in the mind, you've formed in the mind, right? Um, and so I had to take a look at my mindset and, and figure out what, what was I doing wrong? What was I not doing enough of, or whatever it was. And for me, kind of like one of the biggest revelations was detachment. You know, I kind of detached myself from, I kept chasing, you know, and, and I started to realize like, well, when you chase a rabbit, it's going to run away. And maybe one time out of 20, you'll catch it. But even if you do, it's a pure victory. You're going to be fucking exhausted. Right. Yeah. But instead, if you take your time to set the traps, first learn how to set the trap. And then you set the trap properly and you get the carrot and you get cage and you get everything you need to make everything as flawless and efficient, as effective as it could possibly can be. And then you can focus on yourself. You could start doing other things. You can prepare the tent, prepare everything else before you know it, you check the trap and the rabbit's there. And so that's been my mindset. Now I've detached myself from the outcome. I've detached myself from the rabbit. Right. And so, um, part of that means what do we really care about? Do I really care about, oh my God, I have to hit depth. Oh my God, I have to hit the squat. I have to, I don't care, dude. I, the, what really matters to me is creating a legacy. And the only way you can do that is by being in the present moment through your journey, because that's the reflection of the legacy, right? Mm -hmm. That's what people, that's what tells the story. Nobody, like the reality is this, the whole reason why we care about superheroes and we look at really awesome mythical tales of Greek gods and all this, it's because of the story. It's because of the adversity they had to face. And not only that, but trying to overcome that adversity. And that's what the story, that's what the legacy is, right? It's the yeah. sacrifices that they make. And so for me, yeah, the nine attempts to, it, it, it equals one attempt um, at a chance to create history. I mean, that that's what, that's what it is to me. You know, it's no longer like, again, you kind of have these, this very game day approach. And I've been through that, you know, where it's like, okay, we got to play the board. We got to know that, you know, put yeah, in yeah. bluff attempts and all shit to me, dude, it's such bullshit, man. At this point, I know it's like, a, <laughs> it's, it's, I'm so over all that crap, man. We lift, we lift weights. I'm here to be strong. And if I have to do all that to win, then honestly, I don't want to be a part of it. So, you know, for me again, dude, it, it took me back. I've detached myself from the outcome and it truly has become, okay, how can I create a legacy? What would inspire me? And what Mm -hmm. would inspire me is somebody who looks at it as, you know what, I'm going to take every opportunity I can to create history. Forget about the numbers, forget about everything. I just want to be the greatest. And that's, that's now kind of how I approach it. So you're fine. Like you're taking a swing at like a grand slam at history. You're going to leave it all on the table, but you're also fine. If you strike out, you're going to go right back to the drawing board and you're going to jump right back into that process again until eventually you connect and you, you do hit that grand slam. Um, so I think that's, what's interesting, you know, that's, what's different about you is like, you're not interested in these like small titles. I mean, things like world champion. I mean, these are big titles in our sport, you know, but you're really about building something bigger and beyond just, you know, a string of titles or a string of performances, but something that would really shock the world and really like really inspire people to do something different. Um, yeah, I love that. I, you, yeah, go ahead. I, yeah, real quick, I want to mention too, because I and some people don't like it when I say this, but I think they don't like it because it's the truth. Mm-hmm. There are new world champions, and a lot of them, because we have a lot of different weight classes on the men and women's side, every single year. How many of them do you know? Yeah. How many of them can you rattle off? How many of them do you know from 10 years ago, five years ago, yeah. three years early? I bear I'm in it. I'm I'm in it. I'm yeah, at that level too. and I barely know anybody. And it's not out of disrespect. It's just why? What 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 is there to remember? Yeah. So the title is cool. The title is kind of like an affirmation of your work, 
right? But if you're confident in yourself and you know that you work your ass off and you know that you give everything you have and you do it with good intention, then you don't need a title to affirm the work and the preparation, right? Yeah. Instead, you're trying to, at least for me, and this is kind of like what someone like my mom has reminded me about, um, is it's about the people that you inspire along the way. That's what you're doing it for, you know? And, and that's what creates the legacy because that's what pushes everything forward. Um, so yeah, the world champion title, like it, it definitely still means something to me. And I think that that's important, but it, it, dude, it goes so far beyond that. So, yeah. I mean, you mentioned that, you know, like beyond the trophies, um, it's, it's becoming the person that you have to become to be the strongest 93 kilo in the world. Right. So like whether you end up coming up a half a kilo short or not, or missing something on depth or whatever, it's, you're still that person. You know, you're still that person that shows up and that you became the strongest Gavin Aiden you could possibly be. And you're going to inspire a ton of people along the way. You are, you obviously already have, man. So, I mean, like you've made an impact on the game already, but yeah. So it's a process. Um, I think what you kind of like to kind of summarize it a little bit is that you've, you've really motivated yourself in jumping into that process as opposed to a specific outcome along the way. But if you commit yourself fully to the process and you do what you know you're capable of, those outcomes will just sort of, those boxes will check themselves as you go along the path. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's get into a couple of numbers here. Um, so we kind of like, you know, get into our Sheffield preview, like, you know, some specific numbers and things like this. And then I'll ask you a bunch of fun questions um, so people can kind of get to know you a little bit better. Um, we got a lot of things to talk about. So we'll go through this quick. Um, you totaled 880 at Ron at, at in Daytona, pushing Keiko to the absolute maximum to the limit. The world record done by chance is 878.5. So you've already done two and a half kilos above that. That was this year's world championship. You said you're going to hit 900 kilos and beyond at Sheffield. So now we're two weeks out. How are you still feeling about that statement? I know you don't want to give a specific number, like, you know, I'm going to hit 910 or something, but um, 900 kilos, that's still going to be on the table. Is that going to be like second attempts for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my goal, of course, is to do is to give everything I have. And I think based on how I'm feeling mm -hmm. and based on how prep has gone, I've been very blessed. Uh, lots of injuries and stuff that I've battled in the last six months and uh, and some other things. But um, I've kept the faith, you know, and I and I trust God's timing, you know, so and, and, and it does, man, it feels good. It feels like things are kind of come, coming together. You know, like I said, I've detached myself from it. I'm not expecting mm -hmm. anything. Um but based on, you know, how training has been going, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm extremely confident that we'll be able to, uh, I, I, let me put it to you this way. I, I think it was John who sent me a message. He was like, dog, I'm not staying up late to watch you do anything less uh -huh. than 900. Like the, 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 that is, I said yeah. it in the video and I meant it. It is yeah, the yeah. baseline, especially okay, for good. 93s, man, especially for 93s. We have no excuse, no excuse to not be hitting nine. All of us should be hitting 900. <laughs> Yeah, man. I mean, I love that you're coming in and lighting that fire under the 93s and pushing it up. I mean, 878 is a big deal. You did 880. I mean, there's a couple people who've done around 880. Um, but, you know, that's the world record, 878.5. So it's there. Um, I think I think amongst the world records, if you guys are talking about going into the nines, um, that'll put you in the running for sure to win this thing, um, to, you know, walk away as the champ. So I've seen, let's just go through each lift here. So I, I've, I'm looking at your squat. I see you hit a, a 300 kilo by five PR, which was a big one. I've seen a 317 single, uh, 317 and a half single that moves like an opener. Um, I've also saw you did a 326 for a double, which was a PR. And a, your comp best is 327 and a half for a single. So you're basically doing your comp best for a double. Um, and then, you know, today you posted a 322 and a half that moved really well as well. The world record there is 331.5. So is that is that a world record that you have your eyes on that you're going to smash? Because, I mean, dude, you just doubled 327 or 326. So, I mean, it looks like that's that's well within your reach. Yeah, I mean, we definitely, um, I mean, I've said this before. Uh, I plan on trying to chip the world record on my second attempt okay. um, and give me room to, uh, I have no plans of retaking a second attempt for my third, even if, let's say, I were to miss it on something. Mm -hmm. Um and then I'd, I'd like to see just how strong I really am on that third attempt on squat. That's going to be fucking exciting, man. Um, we're pumped to see like, cause I know you've attempted that world record before we know you're good for it. I mean, it moved quick in South Africa and it's just a matter of, you know, getting those lights, whether they're going to be there or not. Um, you did mention today that all your squats hurt and feel heavy. And, um, <laughs> I caught that little tidbit in there, contrary to popular belief. Um, 
are you banged up or are you just speaking in general that like people think it's easy when they see you squatting, you know, these huge numbers all the time, but like, it still feels heavy every time, even if it's something like, you know, 300 for five, um, you know, which is well below where you're capable at for a single that weight still feels heavy. Is that what you're talking about? Or are you banged up? It's a little bit of both. I mean, okay. I am always banged up. Um, mm-hmm. something always hurts. I'm always achy. Uh, it's kind of like the price you pay for pushing your body, you know? Um, at the end of the day, people forget that like, we are the, we are less than like the top 1% point, like literally nine 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 percent of the human population, let alone, uh, 93s in powerlifting. Right. Yeah. So like, yeah. um, we're doing things that I'm not going to say that the human body wasn't built to do because motherfucker, we're doing it, but yeah. It's more so just the reality of in order to push your strength and get better, you do have to flirt with that line of, yeah. are you doing too much? You know? Um, so yeah, so I'm always banged up. It is what it is, but also, yes, the weight always feels heavy. The weight feels heavy from three reds all the way till six, you know? So it doesn't really <laughs> ever not feel uh, heavy. Um, but it is kind of like, again, I want, it's funny. Like I have a lot of people ask me like, oh man, dude, like it must be so cool. Like it, I'm like, no, nah, dude, it just hurts. <laughs> it's not, it's, it just <Yeah>. hurts. <laughs> and it's, and then I'll tell you um, one thing that is annoying when you're strong is just all the loading up of the plates and all this kind of stuff. Like it's a whole, it's a whole process to go through to, to get up to those kind of big weights. Um, so people, I, I saw Taylor mention the other day, he's like, I'm sick of people thinking this stuff's easy. I mean, and we do because we see it like people like me that are tapped into the social media side of things. We see so many huge squats, you know, constantly in our feeds and stuff like that. We start to take it for granted. But I mean, like you said, from three reds on the way up, it it's heavy. So so people need to respect, you know, the hard work that that goes into that a little bit more. Let's let's jump to your bench. Um, I think the only thing I've seen from you is a one ninety seven and a half bench. Super easy, but a good way is off your two twenty kilo best. How has bench been going in this prep? Yeah, bench has been really strong. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I hit a uh, set with 465 this morning. So whatever okay. that is. Um, uh-huh. I think it's like 210 maybe. Um, yeah. So yeah, so bench has been strong, man. Um, it's something where like I kind of adjusted my grip and adjusted my positioning just a little bit um, this prep. And I'm pretty happy with those adjustments. So yeah, I think everything will come together. I mean, my my goal, again, dude, like I've really kind of like let go of the numbers and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, if I had to give a range, like my, my goal would be to just simply bench what I have benched in the past because it's been so long since I've benched that. So mm-hmm. I think historically, like my past three meets, I've been enough. Yeah. Well, so yeah. So my best bench was 220, which is 484 or 485. Yeah. But historically in the past year, I've only been able to touch like 474. The only meet that I know I had 500 in me was USVI. Um, okay. And I was like ridiculously bloated. Like so it was, I was cramping, but I just knew just because of how bloated I was and how like stuffed I was, um, yeah. from all the carbs and sodium that like, I knew I could have absolutely rocketed 500. Um, but ever since then, you know, I haven't felt that necessarily, but I definitely feel the closest and the strongest I've been in terms of my bench than I have since, uh, Ron Atz. So, which is a really good sign. So that's good. I mean, so, so we'll be looking at, I mean, so looking at, you know, what you did in South Africa, um, and then trying to kind of like gauge and go off of that. Um, you had missed 215, which you hit many times before. Like you hit 215, you hit 220 in comp, you hit 215 twice in comp. So like we know you're capable of that and beyond. So um, I just try and give the people a little bit of like what to watch for. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's see if Gavin is bench pressing 220 or above, then you know he's on fire. He's on one, his bench is feeling good. Um, and then let's in the deadlift, I saw like a 322.5 single. That's only 12 below your best moved really well today. Uh, you hit a 210 or what is it? Uh, uh, oh no, you didn't post one today. I'm sorry. I was writing it down. In the yeah. Wrong, I think it might've been page. yesterday. Yeah. yeah but, five, yeah. but the, yeah, that was yesterday. So 322 and a half kilo single 12 below your best. How has deadlift deadlift been feeling in this prep? Deadlift is the best it's ever felt ever. Um, okay. so yeah, so I'm actually really happy and confident with, um, with deadlift. I think, um, we have the strength potential to at least match what we squat, uh, which is a great sign. Um, yeah. again, I, I'm very confident. Spotter. Yeah. I'm very confident in the ceiling that we have for, for deadlift, especially because we have taken a lot of time to work and tweak technique. Um, but either way, I mean, very similar to like my third pull in South Africa, you kind of just 
you just have to load it and just fucking do it. You know, it, it is mm -hmm. what it is. At the end of the day, we just lift weights. You know what I mean? It's yeah. up and down. So just do it, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I feel, I feel and, very confident. And that 335 that you hit in South Africa, it was a big PR. I think it was like a 15 kilo PR for you, um, at, in South Africa, as far as on competition, um, on the platform, I think it was a 15 kilo PR for you in South Africa. And so like, and that was after missing 320. So, I mean, that's the, that's, that's why I'm like, I'm getting goosebumps right now <laughs> because I could see why SPD would invite you to this because it's like this guy, you could miss 320 and then come out and hit a 15 kilo PR on your third, just yeah. out of like what looks like sheer determination, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I can only imagine, like, I'm getting fired up right now. I'm just thinking about it. Um, so, so anyway, let's keep moving. Uh, I want to go through 2022 worlds. Mm -hmm. Um, you're in a four-way battle. You're with Keiko, Emil, Chance, and Gustav. Um, how are you feeling on the day going into that? I mean, were you feeling good in the morning? Was there any kind of problems with your weight cut or anything like that where, where you were feeling drained or anything coming into it? Um, the travel? No, I, actually, you know? I mean, so the, th no, I don't think so. I don't like to make excuses, you know? So like for me, yeah. I mean, there's always something like I yeah. had the monkeys break into my room yeah, yeah, uh, and yeah. steal all my stuff, my Gatorade, my rice, everything I had brought that I like, I was like, I'm prepared for this meet. I learned my lesson from the last one and monkeys come in and literally steal everything. It was, you couldn't make this shit up dog. I was, I was literally like, this is, this is hysterical, but you know what? I, I realized that thank God it was me because I know how to adapt. And for me, I just take it on the chin, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, and it sounds weird, but like, like, and it's not at all to say that any of the other competitors can't do that. Um, they're all obviously where they are for a reason. Um, but I just felt like, you know what? Like I, I would rather this happen to me because a, it makes for a great story, but B, it makes yeah. me stronger. You know what I mean? Like it's, mm -hmm. it's now just another thing that I get to kind of add to my resume. Um, and you know, when you do have those moments of doubt, you can kind of think back and be like, no, 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 no. I've been through worse. I did this. Yes. I did this. I did this. And despite this, I was able to do this, you know? So yeah. Like um, Sheffield seems like it's a long plane ride or whatever, but it's not as long as going to South Africa. And I mean, like yeah. if you're going to be eating, uh, like English food, like, you know, everything's in English and stuff. So it's pretty easy to like figure out you're not going to have monkeys breaking into your room. So it's like, boom, you're already like two steps ahead of where you were in South Africa, like using that as motivation. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely, I think I was at weight. I, I had to do just a little sauna that morning. Okay. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, I mean, I had brought a portable sauna, but of course it didn't work. So that was a waste of money. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think if there's anything that was in particularly honestly no man i just didn't really feel that strong that day i felt really tired traveling tends to do that to me because i mm -hmm. in the historically i've stayed i've tried to get on the schedule of the country that i'm in right mm -hmm. um or the time zone that i'm in so like if it was you know let's say 10 p.m in south africa uh i'm going to bed at 10 p.m right mm -hmm. as opposed to whatever time it would have been in, in eastern and i think that's historically a mistake you know okay. um i think what i've found and what i've learned from both my peers but also just from my experience is probably best to try and stick to your own schedule um especially because for my previous meets dude i would fly out like a week and a half in advance thinking like oh this will be great i'll have enough time blah blah but actually it's worse because now your body's under stress the moment you start traveling, your body now is in kind of like this very low state of fight or flight. Yeah, At least that's yeah. what it feels like for me. And mm -hmm. so when you sustain that for days and days and days and days, on top of not getting quality sleep, on top of the fact that your body thinks it's, you know, 3 a.m. when in South Africa it's 10 or whatever it is, now you're kind of adding all this extra stress that's wearing you down instead of helping you recover. So now by game day, you really feel like, you know, garbage. And that's kind of how I felt in Sweden. That's how I felt in South Africa. Okay. Um, you got yeah, there pretty early. In South Africa? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I was there probably about a full eight days or nine days ahead. Okay, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, dude, if, if it were up to me for Sheffield, I'd fly in like two days before. Um, mm -hmm. I know that the athletes, we have to get there by the 22nd, but otherwise I'd be there like on the, on the 23rd or 24th, so. That's good insights. Um, I know I heard Taylor kind of talking about that, like, you know, he was lifting in prime time in South Africa. So therefore that would be like in lifting in the morning in the U S and so he just kind of trained and just stuck on U S time. I believe, um, I heard him talking about something like that. That's an interesting approach. Cause I think that, that most people just assume get there like eight days early, as long as early as you can afford to get there and then just adjust. But you're right. Just the over stimulus of travel is what I find. It just starts to wear on you over time. And there's a reason why we come back from these meets and we always like 
get sick and, you know, get a cold, like your immune system's running down, you're not sleeping right, you're not eating right. You're, and so, yeah, I could see that that would be a drain. So smart approach. I, will, I mean, this year it'll be in Malta. So uh, similar to traveling to Sheffield, it's kind of just traveling to Europe. It shouldn't be too difficult. Um, the time zones is kind of like evening there is kind of morning here. So it should be, should be an interesting one to test this theory out and see how it goes. Um, who was your game day coach in, uh, in South Africa? Was uh, it Rory, Rory Lynch? Yeah, Rory? yeah, Rory okay. Lynch, yeah. Okay. he did a phenomenal job. Yeah. So take us into your mindset after missing that third squat in South Africa. I know like you're known as the guy, the squatter of the class, like you're, you're, the, you're the class of the class when it comes to squatting. So missing that third squat, you know, you talked a little bit about in the SPD video that it was terrible. I mean, I'm sure it felt bad, but how did you go back into the warm up room? And just sort of put that behind you. Was it, did Rory help with anything? Was there anyone else from like USVI that was kind of in your head helping you like just put all that behind and go bench? Yeah. I mean, so to be honest with you, I'm a very like, um, I'm naturally a very introverted person. Mm -hmm. So the more people and the more shit, like that just like drains my energy. You know, if I could, I would lift in my basement alone every day. That way I can just focus on me, focus on my lifts, focus on what I'm doing, be in my own head and that's it. Um, one of the reasons why I really uh, enjoy, let's say, like having Alex Uslar with me is because he really is a hype man. So mm -hmm. he's very extroverted. And so that compliments me really well because he can really bring a lot out of me. Mm -hmm. um, but And I'm very comfortable with him. But a lot of, and Rory's like a, one of my best friends. I'm so grateful that I met him in the sport. He's a phenomenal handler. Um, for the third squat, we kind of just like, we had the game plan of obviously smashing that. And technically, I really, I was supposed to hit higher than that. Um, mm -hmm. things just weren't feeling strong that day. And so we were like, all right, you know what, let's do what we came here to do. And this will still probably line us up well. And so when I missed that, he didn't really like, he didn't, he was very, very level-headed, you know, he, he kind of just like, we stayed in our lane. He was like, all right, man, like, let's just keep going. And that, that's it. You know, that, that was all it was. It was really me, you know, obviously in my own head, I felt, uh, very defeated. And I think that the, the downside is, Yes, uh, world's judging is very strict. Um, and in my opinion, it, it's, it can be borderline very inconsistent. Um, yeah. However, you can't really make excuses as an athlete in those moments. And um, the downside is this. So the way that my body is built with those heavy, heavy squats, in order for me to like absolutely obliterate depth, I kind of have to dive bomb the squat. Mm -hmm. So what that requires is I actually have to like, and lifters who squat a lot know this, you have to almost like disengage. You have to lose tension, hit that rebound and then regain tension. Yeah. There's obviously one that can cause injury right away. That's very common yeah. adductor strength, like all that stuff. Yeah. But two, the downside is if you do that, your hips can shoot back, right? So if your hips yeah. shoot yeah. back, then you're really fucked. And so in my head, I was thinking like, okay, I have two options here for the 730, uh, whatever it was, 731, 733. Either I dive bomb this and like just go balls to the wall, or I try to do what I normally do in my squats, which is not tempo them, but control them into the hole, hit deep, and then come up. The downside to that approach is two things. One, confidence plays an issue, right? So if you're not as confident, you kind of cut depth easier. Yeah. And two, with the heavier weight, it's so freaking hard for me to feel depth if I go slower because it almost like it almost feels like my hips can't go down any further. That's yeah. why the dive bombing helps because it forces them to get that stretch reflex. Yeah. So I opted for the, the latter. I opted to just kind of like slow it down a little bit um, and feel myself into the hole. That way I wouldn't get hurt or anything like that. And then I would be able to come up, um, you know, and it didn't pay off and I wasn't as confident going into that lift. Um, and so, yeah, so that that's kind of Looking what happened looking at it, it moved well. I mean, it moved very well. It didn't look like, I mean, it looked like, you, like you probably could have went back and taken another 10 minutes and came out and just buried it. Um, yeah. you know what I mean? Like if it were, you, when you hit those kind of things in the gym, you watch a video and you're like, yeah, it was a little high, but man, I feel good after that, that yeah, it was heavy, but it moved quick enough that I should have just buried it. Um, I could see there's a lot of things like running through your head after something like that. But I mean, you came back, you got your mind, right? W what do you have any kind of strategy for that? Or is it just I'm an athlete. I move on. I don't, I don't let that taste linger in my mouth for too long. Uh, I mean, it's, <laughs> I'd be lying if I said I've, if I have a strategy that I've perfected it, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, different things work for different people and different things will work for you at different times. You know, um, mm -hmm. it really comes down to your personality and what's going to work for you in the moment. Uh, for me, obviously I was extremely defeated and I knew that, um, it would be really hard, especially because again, like I wasn't feeling strong that day. I was really yeah. tired. I was really exhausted and just wasn't feeling myself. And, uh, and 
then of, of course, all the thoughts of like, dude, I did work so hard to get here. I did all this, you know, so it becomes so easy to just feel sorry for yourself and all this bullshit, all this soft bullshit. And yeah. when you don't have somebody in your corner, similar like Taylor, Taylor has his dad and his dad is his rock. And I think he yeah. would say this. I'm hoping I'm not putting words in his mouth, but his dad is his hype man, dude. And he yeah. picks him up when he's down. It doesn't happen often, but when, and if it does, his dad will rip him up. And I don't have that. So for me, I have to be my own motivator. I have to be my own guy who rips myself up. And uh -huh. in those moments, it can become really fucking difficult to do that. And so that's what happened. So going into bench, I was like, all right, well, fuck. I mean, I, I really, I don't, I feel like I have no strength left. Like I, I don't even want to finish this meet. I felt the same fucking way in USVI and I felt the same fucking way in Sweden. Mm -hmm. USVI, I missed weight. And I was like, dude, I literally, do, I genuinely do not want to compete anymore. I cannot believe this happened. And I forced myself to do it and we we're better for it. Sweden, mm -hmm. You know, squats didn't go the way I wanted to. Um, and I had felt like shit that it whatever. And I was like, and there was a bunch of other shit that was going on that was really on my mind and weighing me down. And I just wanted to leave. Like I just, I didn't even want to finish the meet, but I was like, no, no, that's not how this works. We have to finish what, you know, you go through that and you yeah. hype yourself up and you finish it. And so that's pretty much what happened. My strategy was simply just relying on the ex same exact approach I take in training. It sucks. It is what it is. Just fucking do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's no, nobody feels sorry. Nobody feels sorry for you. Nobody's going to come save you. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, nobody really cares either, <laughs> you know? what i mean yeah, so I mean, the only people... person who's weighing these options or, or putting weight on these circumstances is you you know yeah. and so it is what it is man you just keep moving i mean in those two examples talking about uh sweden and when you did usbi nationals i mean you came back and got all three deadlifts after having pretty bad squat day especially in sweden you only made your second squat and then you come back and you hit all three deadlifts so you definitely have the right mindset of like you're not gonna let that carry over into the next discipline um, but I know what you mean too, about kind of like you hold yourself to an extremely high standard. So if anyone's going to be beating you up, it's going to be yourself kind of like kicking yourself, um, coming off that platform, but then it's just compartmentalizing, moving on, just like nothing I can do, but just go, go smash the next one. Um, you, you mentioned, take us into your mindset on the second deadlift. You know, you missed the second deadlift in South Africa. You, who decided that you're still going up? And then, and then like, was there a conversation with you and Rory that after missing that you're still going to go up? And then what were you saying to yourself kind of to just like get motivated and go out and smash that third deadlift? Cause man, it was, I mean, again, it's like a, a one of those goosebump moments where it's just like this man came and he left it all out there and he did not disappoint you easily at that point after missing a second deadlift, missing a bench, missing third squat could have, phoned it in and just took easy lifts and just, you know, rode out, rode out the rest of the mean, tried to save some grace, pad your total a little bit, like score some points in garbage time. If it were a basketball game or something, you know, and then, and then move on, but you didn't like you, you pushed yourself again to the absolute limit on that deadlift. So just take us through that process. Cause I think people, it's very intriguing for us who are fans of the sport to kind of see, think about like what goes on in those, those brief moments when you have to make those decisions. Yeah. So after the second deadlift, I was ridiculously defeated because that was a deadlift that I should be able to hit on any given day, no matter how tired I am. Mm -hmm. um, 700 pounds, you know? So um, as a world level 93 lifter, that should be a warm up, you know? So mm -hmm. um, for me coming back from that, uh, you know, Rory was like, okay, look, here's the deal. Uh, we can either retake that or we can go up. Um, I don't remember if he told me how much, but he said, or we can go up and try and take third. If you get it, you'll take third for now. And if nobody, you know, if, if things don't go well for anybody else, we'll, we'll end up securing third. Okay. Um, I didn't even hear or care about the third place situation. To me, it's no better than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, but in my head, I was like, well, I just failed this, right? So I can be a bitch and take it again. Mm -hmm. Or I can have the courage and the balls to just go up, whatever the amount is that Rory told me, um, Let's just, yeah. then that, that's the obvious answer to me because, you know, it's, and I don't want to sound like it's, it's easy and like I'm special. It's fucking not dude. In those moments, you, all of your being is telling you stop, stop, quit, go away. Don't do this. Don't show your face. Just give up. Don't mm -hmm. even take the third dead. Like in my, my body was telling me, don't even take the third deadlift. We're tired. We're done. We're done. And you have to have the strength in your mind to say, are you fucking kidding me? That is not what we came here to do. Not only that, first of all, there are thousands of people, if I'm even lucky to say that, thousands of people watching this event that are looking to me and I'm going to be a leader. I'm going to lead through action. Is that what a leader would do? Would they take, 
Would they just quit? Would they just give up? And then what's the alternative? What happens if you quit and you give up? Well, you guarantee failure. So yeah. you have to have the mental strength to say, absolutely not. And, and the, the trick for me now is the way I recognize it is the moment things feel a little comfortable and something's trying to pull you into the deep, that's when you go with the, with the uncomfortable decision. That's when you, you make the jump. You say, I don't give a fuck what happens to me. Absolutely not. We're going all in. Push mm -hmm. all my chips to the table. What do I have to lose? You know? And so yeah. um, in terms of the mindset and stuff like that, that is a whole different thing. That's like no different than what I would do to get amped up for any lift. You know, I go to a very, very, very dark place a very deep, dark place. And, um, and there's a lot that kind of goes in, in, in with that. I'm sure every athlete has a place for themselves, uh, especially at this level. Um, and so that's kind of where I had to go. I had to really, really dig deep into that spot in order to, to go for that third deadlift. Um, but it's almost freeing in a way, because again, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Yeah. Yeah. So what the fuck, what, what could you possibly lose your health, your life? We all die one day anyway, yeah. you might as well, you know? Exactly. So that's kind of, yeah, that's what was going through my mind. I love the, I mean, you have, you have such an infectious um, and inspirational kind of attitude here, which is like throwing caution to the wind. And it's like, like in that moment, it's like a, one, one attempt to, again, add to my legacy. I'm the guy that doesn't just phone it in. I'm not the, I'm not the guy that retakes the lift and then, you know, barely makes it or whatever. It's like, I'm going up, I'm going to swing for the fence and I'm going to go out on my shield and by sheer determination and, you know, will of strength, boom you nailed it. And so, I mean, that's where it's like, that's why you're such an inspiration and why people love you, you know? So, um, I think it's, I think keep doing it, you know, as much as people talk strategy and things like this and everything like this. Um, I think like, this is, this is who Gavin Aiden is and no one's going to change him. Um, so moving on, I want to, we got to get it through a couple more things. Um, what does it mean to you to have USA across the chest for the first time? Um, I know this is a, this is a, a big question I want to ask because your world championship was with USVI, your open world championships was with USVI. Now at Sheffield, this will be the first time you'll be, and I'm correct in saying this, correct? That, that you'll have USA across the chest. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it feels amazing. I mean, I, it was a dream ever since I was a kid, you know, I, I still have dreams of going to the Olympics and that's still in the books for me, but, um, yeah. this is kind of like the first step to doing that. Um, yeah, I mean, I had obviously the USA, had, USAPL had split from the IPF. And so us lifters had no way of going to worlds that year. USVI was gracious enough to give us the opportunity. I went represented USVI and, um, it uh, honestly, like they gave us that opportunity. So I felt like yeah. the least I could do was give back and be a part of the team going into that next worlds. Um, and, uh, yeah. And again, nothing against USVI. I'm very, very grateful for everything that they did for me, but, um, USA is my country that, you know, it's, it's in my fucking blood. You know, this is who I am. I mean, I have the American flag behind me cause it's, it's <laughs> fucking beautiful, baby. It's beautiful. It. Um, so I, yeah, I'm very patriotic, man. I, and, and I, and I, uh, I love my country, you know, uh, for all of its uh, imperfections and everything, you know. So I, 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 I love America, and I'm very, very proud, very, very grateful. I get to, I get to represent my country. Yeah, me too, man. And I'm, I'm happy to have you know America in the title of you know the organization that I work for, and um, to be able to have people like yourself coming over and and joining us in powerlifting America. Um, it's, it's awesome. It's great to see, and we're happy to be able to you know create these opportunities and things like this. And um, have you representing us and the United States on the biggest stage is is an honor for us as well. Um, so a couple quick hitters. Um, you're still young. <clears throat> I think you're still a junior. How old are you right now? So I'm not a junior. I'm 24. I will be okay. 25 in like eight days, seven days. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. you'll be 25. All right. Um, what uh, when you were first coming up in the powerlifting? Do you look up to anyone? I I don't think so. Really, you 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 didn't really look up. You don't have like idols in the sport. No, idols would be the wrong word to use. Um, exactly. I drew inspiration from people. Um, uh -huh. You know, I, so the people that kind of inspired me to get into the sport when I was like 20, 21 um, was Russ, Russell Warhe, mm -hmm. and uh, I think Sean Noriega as well, Dawson Windham. And at the time, I don't think I knew Ashton Ruska, but I quickly found out about him. And I would say those people drove me and not in like, oh my God, look at them. I want to do what they do. It was more so like, oh, I could easily do that. I could, mm -hmm. and at the time I was like an 83. So I was like, I'll just beat Russ. Like, give me yeah. two years and I can beat Russ. That was yeah. my mindset. <laughs> I love it. So, um, and it was respectfully, like I had met Russ at my first Arnold before I ever did my first competition. Um, and I mean, 1000% if there was any power lifter who I ever like was really inspired by and would watch their content. And it was definitely Russ. Um, 
And uh, yeah, and I, I mean, for me, man, like I quickly, quickly outgrew all of that nonsense. Like I, it's great to have people don't, I don't want anybody to ever put anyone on a pedestal. Like that's just yeah. not, we all bleed, you know? And so use people as inspiration, but remember that everyone is also imperfect, including me, especially including me. And so what I've learned to do is take qualities that I like, or that I, that inspire me that are better than me in certain people. And I put them all together to make this perfect person, this mm -hmm. ideal state. And that's what I kind of strive towards. Um, so yeah, so I don't really have any idols, but I would say as of right now, um, one lifter who I just always find myself going back to, um, rewatching his stuff and, using as inspiration is Ashton for sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. I mean, hey, those are some good inspirations. I knew you had this, this, uh, attitude philosophy about having idols and things like this. So I wanted to make sure people kind of see that side. Cause that's an interesting way of, of looking up to people, but not putting them on a pedestal. Kind of like you said, taking inspiration. Um, some quick ones. where did you grow up? Uh, in the Bronx, I was born in Jacoby hospital, uh, in the Bronx, okay. New York. And, um, we moved to New Jersey so I could play football at Don Bosco prep when I was, uh, I guess I would have been like 14 around that time or. All right. Like and then that, that fits right to the next question. What was the first sport football? Was that the, your main focus kind of through childhood and stuff? Yeah. When I was a kid. Um, so the, the, it was tough because like where I lived in the Bronx, like we had this league called I nine sports, but like, you didn't really just have like fields and shit, like, like actual leagues and schools didn't have the funding really to have like real teams and stuff really. So especially like the public systems. So, um, I went to, my parents sent me to a, uh, Catholic school for middle school. And that's where I started playing football. Uh, cause the school I was zoned for was just like a little too dangerous for a, for a white boy. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, so they sent me there. I had like metal detectors and gates on the windows and all that stuff. Um, so they sent me there for, for middle school. Um, and that's where I started playing football. But at that time, I mean, I played football, basketball. Um, I also did like Muay Thai and Kenpo and like other fighting styles and stuff like that. But football was probably the main one. And then in high school, um, I was kind of in and out of football. Honestly, it was like the first time I really was, I faced adversity. Like I was, a, I was an awesome player in middle school. And then I got to high school and, and Bosco is like one of the top in the nation, you know? Okay. So, um, and they like it was the first time I ever realized like oh shit I'm not the best anymore I actually have to like get better and I just when I was young I couldn't I didn't know what to do with that adversity and so I quit and then rejoined and quit and rejoined and um but during that time I also did swimming I swam for a year I played okay. equestrian polo for all four years um so you're yeah, a well-rounded I mean, athlete I mean you did yeah a lot. try to be <laughs> yeah try I to mean be. that 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 shows a lot about about your like your spirit and your determination um you have an athlete's mindset for sure um, and it shows on the platform, like we've talked about the third deadlift and stuff in South Africa. That's a kind of athlete mindset. Um, speaking of football, what's your favorite football team? What team, what's your team? Growing up, it was always the Ravens. Okay. Always the Ravens. Still yeah. today, do you watch football? I don't, man. Um, but okay. I just loved uh, Ray Lewis's style. Um, yeah. Before Ray Rice had his incident, I liked mm -hmm. Ray, Ray Rice as yeah. well. Um, so it was always like the Ravens and the 49ers. I always felt like they were the hardest hitting teams. I always felt like they were like the dogs of the sport. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. And so I just, I just love that. Yeah. I love that energy that, that and, Lewis. Was like. Yeah. I love, I mean, dude, that's a perfect fit. Like Ray Lewis, you're, you're like a little Ray Lewis, man. Uh, <laughs> you, you remind me you're, you're about as I don't know thick if I deserve him. that compliment, but you're I'll about take as it. Thick as him as well. <laughs> and like, just like bulldog mentality. Um, do you, do you watch sports then or not really? I mean, do you, do you have any other sports that you watch? No, nah, not really. I mean, I love watching um, hockey in person, like live. That's okay. so much fun to watch. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't keep track of anything. I don't know players' names. Like I, I liked, I enjoy um, characters. Like I enjoy like like Burrow, right? Like Joe Burrow to me is a character. There's more to him than just ball, you know. And so yeah, like. Yeah. Like, like I said, it goes back to what I said before. I don't put anybody on a pedestal necessarily, but I find unique qualities that I see in people, whether it be Mike Tyson or Joe Burrow, whoever. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, I like that about him. That's he's obviously better than me in a lot of ways. What can I learn from that? Or how can I build myself to, to reach that? You know, and that's, that's kind of how I look at it. So yeah, I don't really follow sports necessarily though, like sports teams okay. and stuff. Okay. Yeah. That's crazy for someone from Nebraska. It's like, all we care about is football. That's all we watch all the time. So it's like, you wouldn't be welcome in my house on Saturdays and oh, Sundays fuck. because you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be not in the fall, at least in the spring, you, whatever. But, um, or what type of music are you into? I listen to a lot of shit, man. I mean, I, uh, on rotation, I probably listen to like what I listen to the most is probably metal, lots of metal okay, core. Yeah. Um, but I listen to a ton of rap. I grew up on a ton of rap. Um, mm -hmm. 
I like, I do enjoy like a lot of EDM and stuff. I don't really listen to country except for uh, Zach Bryan. Zach Bryan, I've seen him like three times already. I can't wait to see him again. Okay. Um, yeah. And then every now and then I'll throw on some like cinematic, like orchestral stuff. Like if I really want to get Hans sad Zimmer. and just, yeah, 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 yeah. And just like picture myself in like a Batman movie, you know what I mean? <laughs> I knew you had pretty eclectic taste when it comes to music um, because you'll, you'll throw anything on, on a reel from like a rap song to like some crazy metal stuff that I'm totally unfamiliar with. So, so that's why I wasn't going to ask you like who your favorite band is. Cause I probably wouldn't know. Um, but what kind of movies are you into? Ooh. Um, if and when I watch them, I mean, like, I like honestly almost everything, but if I had to historically look at what consumes my time, like, I love, like, Viking stuff. I love, like, the Peaky Blinders show. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm a big fan. I actually really do like anime, like, mainstream anime stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, superhero stuff for sure. But I, I like darker stuff, too. So, like, for me, like, I like stuff that has a little bit more mood to it, you know, like Inception, yeah. uh, movies like that. Um but I also did like enjoy the notebook too. So, you know, so yeah. like, I, I really do. I just, I like, You're everywhere. I have an You're appreciation for it. Yeah. I have an appreciation yeah. for it, you know? Um, yeah. And also too, like acting is something that always kind of, I, it inspires me in a lot of ways. Something definitely an industry I, I plan on breaking into. Um, and because it's dude, it coincides with so much of what I do. Like yeah. as an athlete, you're a showman and a performer at the same time, especially at this level. Athletes at the Sheffield will not have the luxury of just performing. Like we really do have mm -hmm. to also be showmen. Um, and that sometimes kind of, it just is the performance, you know, but, uh, but then also like content, you know, when you make content, you're acting, when you're on camera, you are kind of acting, you know, you're showing a side, you're expressing something that's something Absolutely. that somebody can relate to, you know? So, so it's cool. So, yeah. So I have an appreciation for, for a whole slew of things. Yeah. I mean, that was, that feeds right into my next question. Is Hollywood waiting on Gavin Aiden? Um, you know, because, and is that one of your life goals is to kind of like crack into the Hollywood scene? I've heard you talk about that in the past. Where are you on the, on the track for that goal right now? So I, I am in preparation for stuff like that. Um, I, I would love to, the thing is like, so growing up, Arnold was like always the number yeah. one. If there was anybody that I put on a pedestal, it was Arnold when I was a kid. And what I loved about it was he was an athlete who lifted, right? Looked awesome. Looked, I loved his confidence and anything he wanted, he got. Like, mm -hmm. I still cannot believe to this day that he became a fucking governor. Like, it doesn't even yeah. make sense to me. He's not yeah. from this freaking country and he became a governor. Couldn't speak English at first. Of and one of the biggest states in the country. Yeah. yeah. And so not like of that, some small state. Yeah, dude. So that showed me what's possible. And so, and I love that. And and there's yeah. a lot of different aspects of myself. I am a very creative person. I'm a very deep person, expressive person. So for me, I want to be able to, to dive into all of that stuff. So yeah, I mean, I would love to, um, I would love to play Wolverine for sure. Like that's definitely on the bucket list for sure. But, uh, and I think it's possible. Like I'm delusional. Like I genuinely do think it's possible. Um, but yeah, no, I'm definitely in preparation for a lot of that stuff. One of my really, really, really close friends, we don't keep as in touch anymore because he's so busy and I'm busy. But um, when I first started way before powerlifting, when I started like the content stuff, he was just starting as like a videographer, right? And we would do like, okay, yeah, I'll do videos for you for free if you post and, you know, whatever. We would do that. We became really, really close friends. And then eventually he moved out to LA to kind of pursue his dreams and stuff. Now okay. he's a full-time director. He does DP work. He does a whole bunch wow. of shit. And, um, and he's coming out with his first uh, real... Um, feature film that was is like three years in the making phenomenal at what he does um and i just i just have this feeling that we're gonna align again yeah. at some point like i just have this feeling so yeah so i'm definitely open to it i definitely plan on doing that uh for sure yeah absolutely so at some point you got to move to la right i mean that's when we know you that's uh, when we know you'll be taking it super serious is when you we'll just, see i mean you know i fly out for meets i'd fly out for for movies for scenes and stuff like that when and if they need me you know i, I don't know if uh -huh. i'd move out to la i've been to la a couple times it's nice but yeah, okay we'll okay see. you want to stay in jersey forever no absolutely not i mean okay. i i appreciate jersey my family's in jersey i love my yeah. family um would i probably settle in new york new jersey yeah eventually um but I would definitely like, I liked Texas, um, but I, dude, I love the beach, man. Like I want to be able to like wake up to the sunrise and like eat breakfast, go train, go to the beach, like go in the ocean, come back. You know what I mean? I Do see some Malibu work. in your future, bro. I see Malibu <laughs> out there <laughs> for sure. Okay. Um, the last question is just, you know, you, you're always so positive and optimistic. You have a very infectious personality. I mean, I think anyone who's met you that. in person, like I, I met you in Austin and you were just sitting there drinking a cup of coffee and I, you didn't know me from anybody. And I just 
said, Hey, what's up? And you're like, just, Hey, pull up a chair, you know, sit down. And you have such a great, um, enthusiasm and positivity that it just, it's very infectious for everyone. How do you sustain that while also being so immersed in social media? Because I know social media can have like a lot of negativity to it. You know, like you see someone like me that's on it a lot, um, running the PA account and stuff you see a lot of bullshit out there. You know, there's a lot of negative stuff, people trying to tear each other down. I mean, this week there was a big controversy with a lot of negativity involved. Mm. How is it? Do you have a, a way of compartmentalizing that? Um, um, do you tune it out or, or what is your approach to it? And how do you, you know, constantly have this like really high level of optimism and positivity? Well, first I appreciate all the kind words. It does mean a lot. I, uh, I think it's important for people to know I am definitely not perfect and I'm sure, um, there have been people who have not had that experience with me. Maybe I was a jerk, you know, or mm. was irritated from something and, you know, reflected that onto somebody else, you know, when they didn't deserve that, you know, so I definitely am not perfect. But um, for me, man, I guess it's two parts. The first is I, I stay in my lane, you know, um, I, I don't, if I, I wish I could delete social media, like it's part of my business. And so I keep it, but um, I don't care about it like that, man. Like it's, I, I just, ah, man, dude, I, I'm so blessed to have a, a loving family and a supportive family. Um, you know, siblings, my parents, like I, I don't need all this shit, you know? And, and mm -hmm. the reality is like, when you stay in your lane and you focus on you and you do like, you have this vision of what you, what you want, what you want yeah. to build. And if that's what you focus on, a, you genuinely will not have the energy. Like you won't have the extra energy for anything else. But B, you won't care, you know, because you start to realize like you are the one responsible for your decisions and the consequences will come, good or bad. And nobody else will have to deal with those consequences except for you. So the more you allow other people to make those decisions for you or influence the types of decisions you make, Again, you're still responsible for them, but now they've become other people's decisions, but yet you deal with the consequences. And to me, that's that's that sucks. We don't want that. Yeah. Um, exactly. so that's 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 part one. Um, but part two, dude, like, and this may be a little dark and moody, but it's real. Um, I'm very negative. Like in my own head, I'm very negative. I'm very hard on myself. I have a lot of I struggle with um despair a lot, you know. Like I have high dreams, I have a massive, massive ambitions. And what scares me is the the close reality and truth that I just may not be able to accomplish what I've set out to because I literally do not have the ability. I was not born with the ability to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I struggle with that because in my heart, I have such grand ambitions. I have such great dreams for myself and I want it. And especially when you see like on social media, other people, other lifters, successful business, whoever it may be. Yeah. And you see them have what you want. And I struggle with this, 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 potential that the potential that I don't have what it takes to do that. That's what I struggle with. And so, um, dude, man, like I, I, I take all that negativity that like could be geared towards anybody else. I, I give it to myself, you know, like I, there is nothing somebody can say to me that's bad. That's negative that I haven't already said to myself. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth. So for me, man, I, I really don't have, I don't, you know, and I also recognize too, dude, like I, I I'm very blessed. Like my mom and my dad raised me in a special way where for me, um, you genuinely like, you want to lift other people up. That's real strength. To me, strength has nothing to do with the platform has nothing to do with the barbell. You know, it's, can you shoulder the burdens of others to make their lives easier? You know, and that's, Damn. that's what this is about, you know? And so, um, and I also, I'm a man of faith, you know, I'm definitely not perfect and I try, uh, but I do believe in Jesus and I believe he died and resurrected. And, and if you think about everything that he went through and all this, the weight and the pain and torture he, he endured for, for me, for us to yeah. save me, um, the least I can do is not, you know, place all my own burdens and all my own negativity and shit on somebody else out into you the know? world. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I Not mean, to get you, all, you know, whatever. You do but. you do a damn good job. I mean, to say like that you're a super negative person, I think I kind of have that tendency as well to just, you know, internalize a lot of my own negativity and be my worst critic. And um, it is hard sometimes to not let that spill out and like go on social media and like talk shit or something like this. Um, but you do, you handle it like really, really well. I mean, uh, from, from the outside looking in, 
it's all positivity and um, you know, optimism and enthusiasm, and it's very infectious. And I think that's what people really love about about you. So um, keep it up, keep doing these things, man. You're a huge inspiration for all of us. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on here and do this. We we ended up going for an hour instead of the half hour that I promised. Um, so I'll let you go, but um, I, I really appreciate, it, man. And um, just keep doing your thing, like just keep being Gavin Annan, and that's all any one of us ever will expect from you, and that's all we want. So. Dude, um, thank you. Paul, thank you, man. Seriously, I, yeah. I cannot thank you enough. I genuinely, I really enjoyed my time on this podcast. I hope the listeners enjoy this too. Yeah. Um, and I do have a parting message. I just want people to understand that the best way to predict the future is to create it. And part yeah. of the reason why I can be so positive with other people is because I genuinely, in my fucking core, believe that both my, myself included, but all of us have the ability to achieve anything that we set our minds to. If it's humanly yeah. possible, we can fucking do it. And you just have to believe in yourself. You really do. And I genuinely do believe in every single person that I meet, especially because I see everyone else and I think, wow, dude, look how amazing. I wish I was that amazing. And whatever yeah. it is that they do, it could literally be how they smile, how they mm -hmm. look at somebody, you know? And I just think like, oh my God, dude, that's all. I wish I could do that. I can find something in everyone and it's a gift of mine. And so that that's what inspires me to make sure everybody understands and remembers and realizes the greatness that's within them. So for everybody listening, you can achieve anything you set your mind to. Let's fucking get it, baby. And tune in to the Sheffield. Don't you dare miss yes. the Sheffield. <laughs> Absolutely. We're all pumped as hell for the Sheffield. And I mean, man, just, you know, you're wise beyond your years. You're 25 years old. You're spitting crazy knowledge on here. Um, you're giving to people all kinds of inspiration and everything well beyond your years as a, as a young 25 year old. I'm, I'm just, the future is extremely bright for Gavin Aiden. I can't wait to see where you go. We'll follow your, your journey all the way out to LA, LA and Malibu and wherever <laughs> it goes from there, man. So, all right. Well, with that, um, thank you again to everyone that's listening to this and thank you, Gavin. And with that, peace out.